Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Insecticide Resistance, Mechanisms, and Management. This webinar is brought to you by our sponsor, Control Solutions. I'm Kelly Limpert from North Coast Media, and I will be your event manager today. Before we begin, I'm going to go over a few ways that you can participate during today's presentation. Although you are currently in a listen-only mode, we encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. Just type in the Q&A box at the bottom left, then click Submit to place your question in queue. You can also submit questions via Twitter by using the hashtag PMPWebinar. Questions that were submitted during registration have already gone to our speaker and may be answered in this webinar. If you experience any technical difficulties during today's event, use the same text box at the bottom left to tell us about your issue, and Assistant Producer Bethany Chambers or I will personally assist you. Finally, a recording of this webinar will be available tomorrow afternoon at mypmp.net slash webinars. A link to the on-demand recording will also be emailed to you when it is available. If you have any colleagues who couldn't make it today and you'd like to share this webinar with them, you can do so at any time via the social media links on your screen to the left. And with that, I'd like to turn today's event over to our moderator, Pest Management Professional Senior Editor, Will Nepper. Thanks, Kelly. As Kelly said, I'm Will Nepper, Senior Editor for Pest Management Professional, and we're happy once again to have Marie Knox, Technical Manager of Product Development for Control Solutions Incorporated with us for another educational webinar, this time Insecticide Resistance, Mechanisms, and Management. Um, without further ado, I will just pass things right on over to Marie and we'll get things started. Thank you, Will, and thank you, PMP, um, for inviting me again for another fun-filled webinar. We are going to cover insecticide resistance mechanisms and management today. And it's kind of a big topic, um, probably much too big for an hour. So we're going to skim the surface so we all can get a better understanding of what happens um, with resistance, how it develops, and some steps we can take um, to either slow it, delay it, or rectify it after the fact. For today's agenda, we'll be covering several facets of resistance. We'll cover what insecticide resistance is, how it occurs, the four types of insecticide resistance, as well as management strategies. We will, I know everyone's excited about this, cover commonly used math formulas. And you might be wondering why I'd be throwing math into this presentation. It speaks to rates. And you'll see how using the right rate from the get-go can help you with um, slowing insecticide resistance. Then we'll touch on some really interesting online resources that are available to, available to you from a group called IRAC, the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee. And we'll wrap it up with some questions. So what is insecticide resistance? Resistance to insecticides and acaricides, that's, that's just for mites, may be defined as a heritable that's an inherited or genetic, when we say heritable, change in the sensitivity of a pest population that is reflected in the repeated failure of a product to achieve the expected level of control when used according to the label recommendation for that pest species. So it's basically an inherited genetic trait over time. Resistance arises through the overuse or misuse. And when I say misuse, I don't mean necessarily off-label or illegal applications. Um, I'm really focusing more on maybe sub-effective um, sub rates being used, a sprinkling, if you will. You'll hear me refer to it as a sprinkling of the active ingredient rather than the full dose. So it arises through the overuse or misuse of an insecticide or a caricide against a pest species and results in the selection of resistant forms of the pest and the consequent um, evolution of populations that are resistant to that insecticide or, or a caricide. So we'll look at kind of a schematic here on, on what it looks like and how it occurs. 
Normally, when I'm giving this slide, um, I can pop through things. Uh, so I'm only showing you what I want you to see. Now, you're seeing the whole kit and caboodle right now. So we're going to focus on that circle that's at about 10 o'clock. So we're going to go clockwise around, and we're going to start with um, the circle that has just two red cockroaches, and the rest are uh, multiple little black cockroach icons there. Now, the red ones represent the resistant individuals in the population. They carry a gene or have um, a genetic predisposition to be resistant to a particular active ingredient. And the black ones represent the susceptible population. So those would be the ones that would succumb to your insecticide treatment or die. So you have this population where you might have a couple there that you could even refer to it as they're a little stronger, a little tougher than the other guys. Now you go ahead and spray or apply a product for that population. And it could even be a bait. So please don't um, don't focus too much on the, the word spray there. So we'll just say a treatment. Now that treatment takes out a majority of the susceptible ones, but it leaves behind the resistant ones. And then maybe there's a few susceptible that made it through because they didn't either get into your treatment or they didn't take the bait or they're on the road to developing resistance themselves. Now these individuals that are left behind after your application or treatment, they breed. And what happens when they breed? They pass on that genetic information to their offspring. So you are creating a population where now you're going to have some more of those red ones, those resistant ones, and you'll have some of the susceptible ones as well. So this might be a time when you get a call back or it's the time for your next application. Maybe it's not a call back. And you go and you treat again, maybe using the same or, or definitely using the same product with the, maybe the same AI, and here's where your callbacks start. You take out many of the susceptible individuals, but obviously leave behind the resistant ones. And as this population breeds and breeds and breeds, it's producing more and more resistant offspring and less and less susceptible until finally you have a fully resistant population and you go back and you might go back over and over again, and do repeated applications of the same product or same active ingredient, and you're not getting control. And that is the development of resistance in that population. Now there are four types of resistance that we're going to talk about in this presentation. Metabolic resistance, altered target site resistance, behavioral resistance, and penetration resistance. We're going to take these one at a time. And I'm going to have you, as we, as we go through each of these, you're going to have to um, imagine with me, since we can't see each other at the moment, you'll have to imagine uh, what I described to you so we can fully uh, grasp these, these types of resistance. So metabolic resistance, what does that make you think of? Metabolism. So resistant insects may detoxify or metabolize or destroy the toxin faster inside their bodies than susceptible insects. Or they may quickly rid their bodies of the toxic molecules. So basically they got a better metabolism than their nest mates. So the insecticide either doesn't get to affect them in the time that it's in their body or the enzymes within their bodies just chew up those active ingredients much too fast so they don't have a chance to work at the target site that they're meant to inside the body. So metabolic resistance has to do with metabolism or the breakdown of those, um, those compounds inside the insect's body. It is the most common mechanism and it often presents the greatest challenge. Why? Because insects in this manner, use their internal enzyme systems to break down the insecticides. So they were either, they either started with a better, stronger set of enzymes or a greater amount of those enzymes in their body, and then they pass that ability or that trait genetically onto their offspring, or they, through time, 
their bodies have learned to create more or produce more of these enzymes because they've been having to deal with over and over um, applications of the same active ingredient. So resistant strains might possess higher levels or more efficient forms of these enzymes. And in addition to being more efficient, these enzyme systems also, and this is an even bigger problem, may have a broad spectrum of activity, meaning that they're not just specific to, say, pyrethroids they can cross over and degrade many different types of insecticides. So that's what we have to be cognizant of, is that it may not be a one-to-one, -one. like, well, they just have great enzymes to break down pyrethroids. Well, they might, those same enzymes might be able to break down several other types of, in, of active ingredients. So it's something we have to uh, keep our eye on. Now the second one we're going to touch on is altered target site resistance. Uh, let's have you all remember back, um, it's probably high school biology, or just think of, do you remember the drawings of the nerves and the nervous system? Uh, so looking at, it's kind of like looking at two pieces of string. And if you lay those two pieces of string in front of you on the table, there's, there's a little gap. If you lay them end to end, you make a little gap in between the two ends of those two pieces of string. Now that little gap is the nerve synapse, so pretend each string is, is the nerve. So pulses and chemicals transmit from one end of a nerve across that blank space, that synapse, and they plug in to a specific spot on the other end of the nerve, and that's how the nerve impulse, if you will, travels. Now we're just talking about stuff that's uh, like a neurotoxin. So think about that little synapse, that little space between those, those two nerves, and think about the fact that the little chemicals and chemical messages plug into a space like a lock and a key. So that's a site. They have a little site on the other end that they plug into, and then the message gets transmitted on down the line throughout the body. So the site where the toxin usually binds, so there are neurotoxic chemicals, and active ingredients, and that's how they work. They, they fake out our body, or not, I shouldn't say our body, but an insect's body, and they plug into, they either bind to those sites, or they facilitate um, a nerve movement. So they can either speed up the nerve process, and you see the cockroach kicking, like, you know, on its back, kicking, 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 and then dying, or they slow down the process. So this site becomes altered the site where the toxin usually binds to becomes modified or altered. And this is, you know, due to repeated use of the same um, active ingredient. And it reduces the insecticide's effect. This is the second most common mechanism of resistance. And it's usually the one that if I present this live, I'm drawing on a chalkboard behind me so to, to show it. That's why I had to give you that visual. Um, description to kind of have give you a better idea of this this altered target site resistance. Hopefully, hopefully it made some sense. The third one is behavioral resistance. Resistant insect may detect or recognize a danger and avoid the toxin. It's a learned behavioral response that does get passed from generation to generation. This mechanism of resistance has been reported for several classes of insecticides, including organochlorines, organophosphates, carbamates, pyrethroids, and probably several others. Insects may simply stop feeding if they come across certain insecticides, and it has nothing to do really with non-repellent or repellent. Um, we've talked about those traits of different chemistries, so we won't get too far into it uh, today, but they, regardless of whether or not it's repellent or, or, or non-repellent, they simply stop feeding or the insects may leave the area where the treatment occurred or the spraying occurred. Um, in agriculture, for instance, they may move to the underside of a sprayed leaf if it uh, you know, doesn't have any of the toxin on it, or they might move deeper into the crop canopy, canopy or they might fly away or move away from the target area altogether. 
Now I had alluded to when, um, on the agenda slide that we're going to talk about the Insect um, Resistance Action Committee, Insecticide Resistance Action Committee, and that's down there, that little reference, uh, www.irac-online. A lot of information from today can be found there, and I'll be showing you some really cool stuff that they have for you near the end. So um, hang on for that because it's, it's uh, information you can use daily with your teams or weekly, and it's really fresh stuff that you can uh, beef up your own training programs with, and it's free. It's free and it's available online, and we'll, we'll go into depth in a little while about that. Now the last one we'll talk about, think of this as having a thick skin. So if you got a really thick skin, you know, a lot of stuff just kind of doesn't penetrate, right? It doesn't get through to you. So penetration resistance is where resistant insects, they might absorb the toxin either more slowly or not at all uh, versus susceptible insects. Penetration resistance occurs when the insect's outer cuticle develops barriers which can slow absorption of the chemicals into their bodies. This can protect insects from a wide range of insecticides. So just like those enzymes we talked about with the metabolic resistance, and it can be broad spectrum, this is another broad spectrum type of resistance. So if, you know, if they've got a nice thick cuticle, it can protect them not just from one AI or one type of insecticide, but it could run a wide range. Penetration resistance is frequently present along with other forms of resistance, and reduced penetration intensifies the effects of those other mechanisms. So um, like with pharmaceuticals they call it, or, or with medical stuff they call it a comorbid condition, meaning two conditions together, or one is generally found with the other. Same thing here, penetration resistance is often found with other or in connection with other types of resistance in the same population. Now let's explore just some of the principles of insecticide resistance management. We've talked about what resistance is, we've touched on four different types and what, what they mean. Now we'll talk about some principles behind resistance management. Like what do we, what do we seek to do? What are we planning uh, to accomplish when we put together a management strategy? Or why would we want to manage, manage it anyway? So insecticide resistance management strategies seek to minimize the selection for resistance to any one type of insecticide or a caricide. So we want to minimize that population's ability to pass on these traits to their offspring. It requires an understanding of insecticides, and I don't, don't want to scare anybody because we got some cool uh, tips and tools for you at the end to make it really easy, um, but it requires an understanding of insecticides as they're grouped according to similarity of mode of action, and mode of action is how an insecticide works inside the insect's body and what biological systems it may affect and, and what it does to control insects or mites. So you don't have to be a chemist um, or a biochemist, so you know, don't, don't run away from your, your screens just yet. But we're going to have some really cool stuff at the end to help make this super easy. So in practice for resistance management, Sequences or rotations of compounds. You know, you've probably heard, oh, you got to rotate your treatments. Or a good example is roach baits. You got to rotate your roach baits. Now, rotation doesn't mean we just grab a different brand name. Rotation or having sequences of these different compounds from different mode of action groups is where we're going. So we want to know, you know, a long time ago, gosh, going on 20 years ago, more than that, we were taught, oh, hey, there's four classes of chemistry. Remember, it was uh, what pyrethroids, carbamates, organophosphates, and uh, biologicals. Um, well, that list has grown, grown, grown exponentially. Uh, so we, and it's based on mode of action now. So not just those classes, if you will, of chemistry. It's how 
how a product or how an active ingredient works, and it's rotating it based on how it works. So we no longer can just walk into our chemical rooms and just trade one bottle for another because we might be actually just using, you know, even if it's a different active ingredient, it could still be working in a similar manner in the insect and it might not achieve the results. So we're going to focus on mode of action as we move forward. So the objective of resistance management is to prevent or delay resistance from developing. And it can also be used to help regain susceptibility in insect pest populations in which resistance has already arisen. Now, I'm going to tell you it's much harder to turn back time or reverse the clock. Remember that, that drawing from the beginning with the circles and the resistant roaches and the susceptible roaches, those red and black roaches? Think of moving counterclockwise backwards from a population that's all red or resistant and trying to breed, if you will, breed out of that population uh, the mechanism of resistance that has developed. So that's very hard. Now, it's much easier, trust me, to be proactive and delay or prevent resistance by practicing what we're going to learn moving forward. And that helps us to maintain the efficacy of valuable insecticides. We want to make sure that everything that's out there remains an effective tool for you so that we're not just left with, you know, one or two things that, that work because then we'll only have one or two things to rotate as we move forward. So I like to say don't throw out the quote-unquote old, old molecules. We want everything, whether it's a, a shiny new active ingredient that was just launched or something that was launched 20 years ago, we want you to still have that in your toolbox so that you know the more AIs we have available and the 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 very uh, the various modes of action that are available to us, then it makes rotation easier and it makes delaying or preventing resistance easier. So let's look um, at some of these different strategies and look at the alternations or sequences of different modes of action. Mode of action, you've heard it before, it's how something works in the insect. So now there are some principles, different principles of resistance management. I'll do my best, um, not confuse anything uh, with each of these, and I'll do my best to, to make sure you understand exactly what I'm saying, because you know we'll get to one that you'll go, what did she just say? So moderation, moderation, everything in moderation, think about that. That's limiting the amount or number of applications to preserve the susceptible gene. Moderation means, you know, an example could be using product X only three times in a year and then using product Y some other times, or instead of just products, think about biological controls. Think about mechanical controls so that you're not just always spraying and, God forbid, always spraying the same thing over and over and over again. Now, with moderation, very important, and with anything, it's very important to use the correct rate from the beginning. That's why we're going to do some math today. I'll show you. Um, even even with super seasoned professionals and, and some of the newbies, you know, I've shown a lot of people that when you really look at the math, you might be out there, you think your team is doing the right rate, but in reality you've been sprinkling the chemical, sprinkling the treatment, um, or spreading it too thin, if you will. So we'll, we'll look further into that, but using the correct rate from the beginning is very important because remember, if you're doing moderation and you're limiting your number of applications, then you want to make sure you are doing the right rate each time so that you're effectively taking out the highest number of that population. Now second is saturation, and this is where usually I get the hands raised and 
and people going, what are you talking about? You want to hose everything down? No. It does not mean saturating the environment with products or active ingredients or chemicals. Instead, we're talking about saturating the insect's defenses by on-target dosages high enough to overcome resistance. And generally, it's using the right rate from the beginning. And there are multiple rates on a label. Let's touch on this real quick. I want to make sure everybody realizes there's a you know, general, direct, general directions for use section on the label. And in that section, oftentimes, it'll give a range of rates. And it might be you know, the first paragraph once you're getting into the directions for use. It'll give a range. It could be you know, 0.33 to 1 ounces, or to 1 ounce, um, maybe per gallon. I'm just using this and just pulling this out of the air. Now, that doesn't mean that that range is effective for every pest that that label has listed on it. You have to read further through your use directions to your specific target pest. And that labels are set up pretty much in this way now. So you might go down and see that, oh, for mosquitoes, oh, 0.33 ounces, that works. So it shows like you know that range specifically in the mosquito section. But then if you move to say the cockroach section, well it might say a half to one ounce or one ounce only for cockroaches. So I need everybody to realize that you got to read further through the label to make sure that you're using the right rate for the pest you're targeting. That's very very important. Okay, and that does speak to saturation because you're using the dosage that is high enough or correct for that targeted pest. And um, you could overcome resistance in this manner as long as you're staying within your labeled rates, um, but mainly it is to delay or prevent. Now, formulations, saturation is also not just, you know, maxing out your dose on the insect, but it's, it's saturating all facets of how an insecticide might attach to an insect, how it might work in the insect, how it might be taken in. So we're talking about formulations. You could offer a smorgasbord, like use a microcap uh, type product, a microencapsulated product. You could combine that with some baits. Maybe there are attractants or synergists, like PBO, synergists magnify the effect, if you will, of an active ingredient in the insect. So it's kind of like you're, you're, you're dosing that insect with a higher dose when you're really not using a higher dose. The synergist amplifies the activity inside the insect for you. So that's what we mean when we talk about saturation. We're saturating the insect for, through different means, not just blanket super applying you know, one product. And then there's multiple attack. This is really cool to me. Um, it is the basis for our product development platform here at CSI. You've probably noticed, uh, if you pay attention to us at all, um, that we've been really heavy on what we call combination chemistry. And this is overwhelming an insect population through multi-site, multi-directional selection. All that means is mixtures and rotation. So mixtures of products, you know, now you're going to start seeing these, these products on the shelves. They don't just have one active ingredient. They have two, three, four, five. You know, they have, in those different active ingredients, I really hope each has, offers a different mode of action, works differently inside the insect's body, because that's our focus with combination chemistry. Um, Fuse is an example of one of our products. Techo Pro is a dual IGR, which is really cool. It's a juvenile hormone analog and a chitin synthesis inhibitor in one product. Um, but you're hitting the insect. It's like a one, two, maybe even three, four punch. This is cool to me, multiple attack. So you're going to see more and more, um, and even a lot of researchers, professors, a lot of industry experts have come out talking about this tool of combination chemistry, this tool of using combination products that offer different modes of action within one product as a great resistance management tool. We're going to get a little deeper 
And we're going to talk about mode of action still, target site resistance, like we talked about, and then also cross resistance. So I'll take you a little deeper into resistance and resistance management, and then we'll come back up for air. So in the majority of cases, not only does resistance render the selecting insecticide ineffective, so meaning your product A just doesn't work anymore, but it often confers a cross resistance to other chemically related compounds. So just because you um, are trading lambdacyalothrin for bifenthrin, you're picking two different pyrethroids, um, you're, if you've got resistance to one active ingredient in a group of active ingredients, you're more than likely going to have cross resistance to the other ones. So you're going to need to just leave that group all together, okay? And compounds within that specific uh, chemical group usually share that common target site within the pest and they share the mode of action. So you have to leave the group. Now I'm going to talk about groups for a minute. Actually, I'll probably talk about groups in a couple slides, but um, on your labels, you will see, when I, you'll start hearing me say the word group, there's a group number on the labels, and almost everybody's putting it on their labels now. And that is, it's a tool to help us know what group we're using and when we are picking a good rotational product, because it's going to be in a different group. So it's common for resistance to develop that's based on a genetic modification of a target site, like we talked about before. And when this happens, that compound loses its pesticidal efficacy. So we've already covered that. And because all compounds within the chemical subgroup share a common mode of action, there's a high risk that resistance will automatically confer cross resistance to all the compounds in the same subgroup. So it's a concept. It's this concept of cross resistance within the chemically related insecticides or within the group that is the basis for mode of action classification. Mode of action classification um, is so helpful and uh, you can use it to your advantage and it simplifies everything for us. So constant use of insecticides from one group, one mode of action, will increase that risk of rapid buildup of resistance to that chemical group. Alternating use of chemical groups with different modes of actions will slow down this process. Now, I do see a question that just popped up. And the question from the audience was, so basically, you need to switch the mode of action, not the active ingredient. Yes. Yeah, short answer to that question is yes. And we're going to get into that now. So, and that was perfectly timed, so thank you. Thank you, whomever typed that in. Um, mode of action and groups. So let's, if anybody has a label on their desk handy, grab it. If not, you can just look at the little snip, the little picture of the Seismic CS label on your screen. Have you noticed any changes in, in labels? Um, specifically, this little bar that runs across it that says group, and then it has, you'll see circled in blue, the so number three, so it's a group three insecticide. This is a pyrethroid. All the pyrethroids belong to group three. So these groups have appeared on many labels, and they are there to help you when choosing products for a rotational program. And I think they're pretty cool. So I did mention this before, that once upon a time we had, you know, that four classes of chemistry, if you will, that we thought about. But the problem that occurred was the confusion surrounding rotating chemistries. You know, envision a shelf, a big white blank shelf, and now envision like 10 bottles on it. Well, five of those 10 bottles might actually be pyrethroids. Back in the day, we would just, if one product, one bottle, you know, seems to kind of not work anymore, what would we do? We would just put it back on the shelf and just grab another bottle off the shelf, not thinking about if it was going to work differently in the insect or not. So true rotation involves rotating products based on how they work in the insect, not rotating different bottles or different brand names. So a big light bulb moment for a lot of people. 
So how active ingredients work in an insect is an active ingredients mode of action, and we must rotate mode of action. So to make that rotation easier, active ingredients have been assigned groups, like we looked at on that seismic CS label. Be aware, though, I don't want to rain on your parade, there is a possibility of cross-resistance among groups when they're based are based on where they target a pest. We're going to look at a picture in a moment to make it easier. You can envision, though, that shelf that we had with the 10 bottles on it. Maybe five of them are group three and two of them are, you know, I'm not sure, group 22, and we'll just throw in, you know, a group two, one of them or two of them are group two. So now let's talk about taking those bottles, and not only are there only a few groups, but Two of those groups might live in the same target box, which we'll see on the next slide, and then the other one might, you know, do something else or, or target some other function inside of an insect's um, body. So we're going to take a look at this mode of action poster from IRAC, uh, the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee, and we're going to count, if you will, how many groups are listed under the nerve and muscle target section. So depending on your screen, you might be squinting, and I apologize, but you can go to irac-online.com or dot, dot .org, and um, that website is on the screen as well. And you can open the PDF. You could download the PDF there. Oh, they have tons of PDFs and posters. So this is under the posters category. I love it. This is my favorite one. It's the general mode of action poster from IRAC. And you'll see boxes. So think about it. We're just further categorizing products and active ingredients. Okay, that's all we're doing. We first put them in groups, and then we put them in these boxes, like nerve and muscle targets right there. That box looks like there's group one, group two, group three, group four, group five, group six, nine, 14, 19, 22, and 28. So what is that, like 11? Um, hopefully I can count. Um, and then there's subgroups in there. So there's a whole smattering. Now there is a possibility, even if you're rotating the groups in there, because they work in nerve and muscle, there is a possibility of cross-resistance there. But I don't want anybody to be too paranoid about that um, because sometimes the best we can do depending on the pest, you know, and what's labeled for that pest and what's effective for that pest. Sometimes it's just going to be, you know, groups that are in the same box. Well, as long as we can rotate groups, we're going to be okay. We're doing something proactive. Now, you'll also notice on this poster, there's growth and development targets, and those, you know, are your, like your IGRs. There's juvenile hormones. There's... Um, probably chitin synthesis inhibitors in there. Then there's, uh, over on the right, respiration targets. So basically, IRAC categorized everything into groups, and then they categorized them even further, and they put the groups in their respective target boxes. So you have mode of action, and then you have target. Target is simply what body system or function you're targeting with your insecticide. So this is a really cool poster. It is available free online. So rotating the groups is a good thing. If you can take it a step further and rotate targets within the insect, then that's literally the best thing you can do. But that's not always possible. And for a million reasons, uh, just some of them would be, heck, you know, there isn't a product available. Maybe they're all in one target and science is working to develop something else, but right now you just have that one target to deal with. So at a minimum, you rotate based on the group, that number on the front of your label. So I mentioned combination chemistry, and this is where you know we consider it multiple attack, and it's mixtures of active ingredients these mixtures, these, these combination products, if you will, they are leading the way in resistance management. I mentioned two of ours already, Fuse Termiticide Insecticide and then Teco Pro is a dual IGR. Fuse is um, imidacloprid and fipronil together in one product, and it is you know, for termite and for 
outdoor general perimeter pest applications. But combination chemistry is, I mean, it's our lifeblood at CSI. It's a complete shift in how things have been done, and it's our whole product development platform. And we don't believe in throwing out all the old active ingredients, what you would consider old. We, we would love to have all of them available and new proprietary fresh active ingredients um, to either combine or use in programs side by side. And it's all to help prevent and manage resistant population. And our focus is on mixtures of actives with these differing modes of action and even different target sites to create effective and economical solutions for our customers, especially where resistance management is concerned. All right, before we jump into all the cool online posters and even online presentations that are there for you to download free, um, as long as they're used for educational purposes, um, we're going to go over some math. And I touched on why you know, previously, because I don't want you just to sprinkle out the active ingredient or sprinkle out the application. Um, I want to make sure that your rates are right from the beginning, because that is a big, that's a key factor that we need in managing um, or even preventing or delaying resistance. So why are calculations important? Well, using just the right amount or rate of pesticide, and this also goes for lawn treatments, fertilizer. I live half my life in turf as well. So you got to use the right rate from the start. It gives you some bonuses. It minimizes the potential for personal property or environmental damage. It maximizes your return on investment. And it lowers the risk for resistance development. Now, some people probably focus on that dollar sign there. So I will tell you, using the right rate from the start is going to reduce your callbacks. And you know that saves you a heck of a lot more money than what you spend on chemical. And it also makes you shine in the eyes of your customers. You have better customer retention. So let's look at um, calculating area. Okay, there's just some basic math stuff I want to go over so we're all on the same page. And you do need to know area. Rates for lawn and pest control products are actually stated per 1,000 square feet. So kind of think about when it says, just for example, one ounce in a gallon of water, it's kind of like, they want one ounce of that concentrate to be spread out using water on 1,000 square feet. And yes, pest control rates are in per thousand square feet. Because think about think about a perimeter pest application. Say it's and I'm going to use some easy numbers here so I can do quick math in my head. Five feet up, five feet out on the outside of the structure. That's a 10 foot band, right? And you're going to measure linear footage around a house. What if, what if it's 100 feet around the house? That's a really little house. But what if it is? Then that's 100 feet times the 10-foot band. That's 1,000 square feet. So your rate, you're going to need to put out that amount of concentrate. If we're talking about liquids. You know, say it calls for one ounce in a gallon. I don't care if you put that one ounce in five gallons, you better have that one ounce of concentrate in whatever amount of water you want put out on that one area of 1,000 square feet. If you have water left over, mix, I should say, dilution left over in your tank afterwards, then you haven't put out the proper amount of concentrate. That's how I like to think of it on that area that it was called for. So Rates for flowers, shrubs, vegetables are often given per 100 square feet. And it's all stated on the label, but this is just a little reminder. To determine how much pesticide or fertilizer is needed for a job, first you've got to calculate the area, the size of the area to be treated. How, you know, I get, it's famous. So I have a famous question that's asked of me, I feel like daily, but it's really not daily anymore. Um, you know, how much do I put in my tank? How, how many ounces do I put in my tank of product XYZ? Well, first I need to know how far that tank goes. How many thousands of square feet is that tank treating or covering? Then I work backwards from there and I can tell you how much. Um, so we need to calculate area. We all need measuring wheels. I hope everybody's got measuring wheels on the truck. Now I'm getting a little preachy, so I apologize. But let's talk about calculating area. First we'll go into a square. Pretty easy. A square is length times width. That goes for a rectangle, obviously. 
So here the area, 80 times 60, if it's 80 feet long, 60 feet wide, it's 4,800 square feet for that square itself. So that's that horizontal area. And that mask is used all the time for termite work, for you know, pre-treats, and for lawn work. A circle, pi r squared. You probably all have that memorized. So say it's a flower bed. In pest control, we may or may not run into circles, but um, you know, here's your simple formula. Area equals 3.14 times the radius squared triangles, and this is a good one to remember, cul-de-sac houses, those lots are kind of triangular shaped. So it could be helpful to know the area of a triangle. It's the base of the triangle times its height divided by two. So say the base is 20 feet on this triangle and the height is 40 feet, you end up with 400 square feet. Now irregular shapes, um, you know, you can basically chop them up into representative shapes that are easy to calculate. So here you've got a triangle, this, this really weird shape is chopped up into a triangle, a rectangle, and kind, kind of half a circle. And you just use the previous formulas to calculate the area of each of these shapes and then add them together and you get your overall area for this irregular shape. So here's the famous question. How many ounces do I put in my tank? This is probably the most common question. I mean, I've asked it. I've had probably every single one of my customers ever for like the last 17 years ask me whether, you know, you're a golf course superintendent, pest control operator, lawn care operator. You've asked me this question. You've asked anybody this question. I've asked it. You got to think in area treated, not glugs into the tank. Remember, our active ingredients now, as new ones are developed um, and brought to market, some of them are getting more and more and more specific. It's not like 20 years ago, 25, 30, 40 years ago, where it was like a super broad spectrum insecticide and you could get away with just a couple glugs in the tank and you knew you were going to get whatever you were going for. Well, Chemistry's come a long way. Rates are more and more and more important because we want to make sure that we're putting out, and a lot of the chemistries today are very rate specific, dose specific, if you will, per insect. So we want to, we really want to be on target with this. So rates are based on active ingredient, like I mentioned, or amount of concentrate, if you will, per thousand square feet, regardless of volume of water. So how many gallons of finished mix do you apply on an average structure? That's my question. So if you have, and we'll look at the math here, say you have a hundred gallon tank. Now I did easy numbers, okay? So You'll have to extrapolate this down. If it's a one-gallon tank or a five-gallon tank, just kind of bear with me. So say you have a 100-gallon tank and you're power spraying five gallons of your finished solution in a 10-foot band around an average size structure. For this example, we'll use 200 linear feet as our average size structure. When you're treating 2,000 square feet, at each structure with five gallons. Okay, so you've got a 100 gallon tank and you're using it, you know, you're doing a 10 foot band around a 200 linear foot structure. So it's 10 feet by 200, it gives you 2,000 square feet. Okay, so for every five gallons in the tank, in, a, in, a, in your 100 gallon tank, five goes into 120. Okay, so say your rate is a half an ounce of product per 1,000 square feet, then how much product would you put on 2,000 square feet? Well, you would put one ounce of product on 2,000 square feet. And if you are at if your certain truck, spray, spray truck, is putting out five gallons on this amount of area, you know, 2,000 square feet, then for every five gallons there, this is how your work would go. Five goes into 120 times, so you're treating 20 homes, but if each home is 2,000 
square feet treated, then you need 20 times that one ounce. So 20 ounces in that 100 finished gallons is going to give you the right mix rate to treat those 20 homes and to treat basically the 2,000 square feet that you normally treat with five gallons of finished mix at each location. Hopefully this math makes sense. Um, but that is really, this is the true answer to how many ounces do I put in my tank. First, we need to know how far your tank goes. And don't think that every technician is the same because they're all like racehorses. They're all different. One technician might only be putting out three gallons or two gallons of finished dilution on that 2,000 square feet. And then what happens? Well, they're not putting out enough active ingredient. They're not putting out enough of a rate. Because the five gallons, we, we calculated based on the five gallons going out on that 2,000 square feet. So I know we don't have it in this presentation, but the bucket test. Um, calibrating your spray rigs. We're just going to use rigs as an example since I'm still on it. Um, you can do the bucket test. And basically you have everybody squirt water out of um, out of their rig into a bucket and time it. Time it for one minute, two minutes, five minutes, whatever it takes for the person to walk a structure. And you'll you'll see that say you you time it for one minute, everybody's going to have a different amount of water in their bucket because our rigs are all putting out a different amount. Okay, so we actually need to do the math based on your technician and his or her particular equipment. We can't assume that everybody's the same. It's a little bit of work on our part, but it saves you money and time and your reputation in the long run. Now the last question, the last math question, is determining the active ingredient uh, content of that finished dilution. So I, I do get this question a lot. Somebody will say, hey, Marie, what if I put you know, 10 ounces of whatever in 50 gallons of water? What's my what is my mix percentage? What's the percentage of AI in that finished dilution? So we're going to look at two examples now. If ever you want to know the formula, this math formula for determining the active ingredient content of the finished dilution, it lives on the Bifen IT label. So another one of our products. Just the math for me is actually on the printed specimen label. So if you're ever wondering, gosh, you know, Marie mentioned this formula, where can I find it? Think of Bison IT, pull the uh, label off our website, and the math formula is right there for you. And that's actually what about all of our guys um, in the field do. So when they think of this or they get the question, they usually shoot the Bison IT out, label out to somebody, and then walk through the calculation with them. So. The, the formula is percentage of active ingredient in the concentrate. So we would look at the front of the label. And so for Bifen IT, the active ingredient is Bifenthrin. And it said, you read it all the way across, it says Bifenthrin 7.9% in the concentrate. So that's what we plug in in that first space, the percentage of active ingredient in the concentrate. Multiplied by how many ounces of concentrate did you put in your tank. Okay, so that gets multiplied together. And then that's divided by, that's why you have that line there, you have the gallons of finished spray mix. So it happens to be, for this example, 50 gallons, multiplied by the number of ounces in a gallon. Now this is the number that's always going to stay the same. There's 128 ounces in a gallon. So our math is 7.9 times 25. They put 25. Say somebody, you, me, anybody put 25 ounces in that 50-gallon tank, draw the line, divided by 50, because that's how many gallons of finished spray mix, times 128 ounces. If you do that math, 7.9 times 25 divided by 50 times 128, it comes out to 0.03% active ingredient in that 50 gallons of dilution. Okay, so if you were putting out one gallon per thousand square feet, then you're putting out 0.03 rate per thousand square feet. Now another example is Taurus, Taurus SC, Cipronel. 
and now we'll do this a little faster, you look at the front of the Taurus SC label, the percentage of fipronil in it is 9.1%, and the label calls for 0.8 ounces per gallon. And then you have the one there because you're only mixing up one gallon in this example, and then the 128 is always there because that's the number of ounces in a gallon, and you get 7.28 divided by 128 equals 0.56 Oh, sorry, there's a typo, 0 0.056875, um, which gets rounded up to that 0.06%. Now, some labels like Taurus and a lot of others, they do have the finished dilution percentage listed on the label, you know, because you've got to write it on your tickets. So some don't have that finished dilution, or when you're doing it like the above bison example, you want to know what's in that larger than one gallon tank and if it's a label that doesn't have that finished dilution or volume um, dilution chart on it then you'll need this formula this math formula to determine um, what your percent ai is in the dilution all right so that's enough of math but the reason we went through the math is to make sure we're doing the right rate from the beginning if you have any questions on math, um, on any of it, actually, feel free. You can ask questions. You know, today live, you can ask me questions later. You can email me. Um, I love to talk about math and make sure that the right rates are going out. So now we're going to touch on the online resource I've been talking about, and that's www.irac-online.org. One of my favorite, favorite places to go online. Now, the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee was formed in 1984 and works as a specialist technical group of the Industry Association Crop Life. So it's a group within a group. It's a group within Crop Life, providing a coordinated industry response to prevent or delay the development of resistance in insect and mite pests. There are a number of member companies that participate and lend their knowledge and their time to this committee. Um, and one of them, you'll see Adama, that is our parent company here at Control Solutions. We are an Adama company. And then you see the uh, kind of a good list of a lot of the manufacturers and suppliers in the business. So irac-online.org offers a number of resources to help educate growers and pest management professionals on resistance and resistance management. When you go on there, there are posters, there's publications, there's videos, there's presentations even, like PowerPoints, uh, like presentations that you're looking at today. They're all available to view and even download. And I'm going to tell you, uh, it's all free and available to you, but you've got to use it for educational purposes, okay? You can't use it, um, you know, to sell something, uh, to my knowledge. I, I know that they're totally cool with everybody and their brother using it for educational purposes. So we already looked at this poster. Now, this poster is uh, the general MOA, general mode of action poster. Here's the other cool thing. So I think they, they offer everything in multiple languages, like Spanish, French. Um, I think there might be Italian. There's, just, there's a slew of different languages uh, because it is an international group, um, an international um, focus. So the posters are in different languages, the publications are in different languages. So it's, you know, it's pretty cool. It's pretty user friendly. Here's another example. This is the bed bug poster. Now, these I would print up and put in my technician room. Uh these ha this is a, a great poster. It covers, you know, what they look like. It has pictures of bed bugs, whether they're, you know, they've started feeding or whether they're engorged, talks about the importance of them as ectoparasites, their medical impact, signs of an infestation, what to look for, and then where to look. I love that little hiding places box that is um, there down in the lower center. It's great. It's like a shot of a hotel room. 
creeps me out. I spend a lot of time in hotel rooms. You can bet I check all of them, and yes, I have found bed bugs as I travel. So you've got to be proactive if you don't want to take the little guys and gals home with you. And then it lists several insecticides suitable for bed bug control and resistance management tools and talks about different application methods. Uh, you know, bed bugs are a multi-pronged uh, if you're going to do like hands-on treatment, you know, there's fumigations available for them and heat treatment, but oftentimes you're still pairing these methods with uh, residuals and residuals can come in, you know, different shapes and forms like dusts and liquids, et cetera. So anyway, this is just a nice example of the bed bug poster from Iraq. And then finally, um, the cockroach poster, pretty great. You could use some of this information now I wouldn't I wouldn't pass these out to homeowners just so you know I would not pass them out to your homeowner customers why well um, I wouldn't pass them out because some of them have insecticides listed and with the insecticides listed you wouldn't want to encourage your homeowner customers to try to apply anything themselves. You know, they, you need proper training and you guys are the experts. So you could take some of the information from these posters and share them, share that information with your homeowners. But just make sure that you always review everything that you find online before you just pass it on to your homeowners. Make sure that it works to benefit you. And remember that you are the expert because you're the one providing the information. And the more knowledge you can share and the more you can educate your customers, the more of an expert you are and you become. Thank you very much. Uh, this concludes our presentation for today, and we really appreciate the time that you have spent with us, and we know your time is valuable, and we appreciate your attendance and your support. I'm going to turn it over to Will Nepper, who is going to handle um, some of the questions with me as we move forward. That's right. We've got a few questions here um, that came in before the webinar, so I'm going to start with those. Um, the first one, is more of a general question, what would you suggest for bed bug and cockroach resistance? That's a great question. Um, for bed bug and roach resistance, uh, first we'll touch on it, and I should have mentioned it during the presentation, resistance usually develops among the fast breeders, because you know this is, um, this is something that's a genetic trait that is passed on from generation to generation. And then the faster you breed or the shorter your life cycle, you know, um, the faster resistance can develop in a population. So keep that in mind. So bed bugs, very, you know, they're good breeders. So resistance does build up um, or occur pretty quickly with them, as well as certain, certain roaches, um, like German cockroaches, super fast breeders, uh, you know, their their whole life cycle can, you know, take place in a month or so versus the larger cockroaches might take up to nine months, you know, or longer. So not all roaches um, have uh, a high incidence of resistance. But for bed bug and roach, for the fast breeders, it's really what we talked about with rotating at least your mode of actions, at least your groups. And also, think about rotating or offering various formulations. So formulations are something I focus a lot on. Just because you have a liquid concentrate that you're going to mix up doesn't mean that all liquids are the same. You've got EC, the emulsifiable concentrates. You have SCs, which are water-based suspended concentrates, so little crystal particles basically of the active ingredient are suspended in water for an SC. Big tip, you got to shake those. And sometimes they settle out. You just got to shake your bottle over time. Um, some other liquids, you got microencapsulated, microencapsulated formulations. So you have different formulations, and those are all just liquids. Then you think about um, baits, and then you also have dust. So a multi-pronged approach where 
you are really beefing up your program. So if your first step is to rotate the groups, then that's a great first step. Then you can take it further and start exploring how different formulations work with the insect you're targeting, whether it's bed bugs or roaches, and you can start adding in other tools to your arsenal. So like adding in a dust or an aerosol, um, you know, with your with baits. Uh, you know, it just obviously don't contaminate your baits. If we're talking about German cockroaches, you don't want to, you know, contaminate them with repellent chemistries, so we do need to know a little bit more. But if you can just slowly progress your program from just rotating modes of action to kind of beefing it up and making it more of a multi-pronged approach, I see that um, as helping you delay the onset or even, you know, prevent resistance from developing with both of those. And, and we know that there's just bed bugs and especially German roaches super common for resistance to develop. So that was a good question. And you mentioned aerosols. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and jump ahead to this question that came in during the webinar. What's the easiest way to measure aerosol sprays? OK. Um, aerosols are interesting. So a lot of times the rates are calculated. And I'm pulling this off the top of my head. So you could double check me. But it's the number of seconds to cover like three linear feet, I believe. It's like one second per three feet or three feet per second. So that is kind of your gauge for how much active is coming out. And now aerosols, you would consider them a ready to use formulation. So it's not like you mix anything up or dilute it. So they're coming out at the percentage that's listed on their label, but they're, that percentage is as a rule of thumb, it's three feet, three linear feet per second is that rate that's coming out. So that's kind of how you measure that. And then for your paperwork um, with aerosols, since it is right to use, you can just list your percentages that are on the label. All right. Uh, next question is a little bit longer than the other ones, but it's a really good question, and it touches on a lot of things. So I thought we'd go to this one next. Is resistance an issue for general pests other than bed bugs and German cockroaches? And is it beneficial to rotate your tank mix from monthly commercial accounts for which you're preventing seasonal outdoor bugs, such as American oriental roaches, ants, spiders, et cetera? That is a long one. <laughs> That's a, a multi-part. OK. Um, OK, so is resistance an issue for general pests other than bed bugs and German roaches? Uh, let's see. Yeah, so the fast breeders. Let's talk about the fast breeders. Um, flies, you got your normal ones, your bed bugs, your, your German roaches. Flies and mosquitoes develop resistance. Um, fleas, fleas are fast breeders, so they tend to develop resistance in their populations. I'm probably um, forgetting some, but that's kind of a handful there. So if it's if the general if the pest is a fast breeder, then that's kind of because this is based on passing genetic material on um, for, to your progeny to the next generation, then you have a higher likelihood of resistance to develop. So is it is it beneficial to rotate your tank mix? It depends on what you are targeting. Okay, so let's cycle back to the fast breeders. If you're going, like you mentioned, bigger roaches, Americans, Orientals, um, and then ants and some spiders. So I'm not super great on spiders. I will admit that right now. So I'm not quite sure if we've had issues with resistance in any spiders. I'm going to go on a limb and I would probably bet on no or not much for spiders. For ants, ants are social insects, and to my knowledge, to my knowledge, it's very rare. Social insects tend to have a longer life cycle and go through a lot, not really a lot more stages, but it's like just a longer, we'll just say a longer life cycle. So from egg to adult, sometimes it can take quite a long time. And for, let's see, for urban pests, so like ants, 
I would say most likely not an issue with resistance, but there has been um, there has there have been some studies and some monitoring. So for right now, social insects like ants, termites, um, not really going to worry too much about resistance resistance happening. And for larger roaches where it's a much slower life or longer life cycle, I wouldn't worry too much. So rotating your tank mix. I don't think it's a bad idea to rotate your tank mix, first of all. Just make sure, you know, that you are rotating different modes of action. And depending on your target pest, you're using the right rate from the beginning. So hopefully, hopefully I answered it. Um, I think we covered it all. General pests, yeah, bed bugs, Yeah. I so think it's not you got it all. We have some more questions? Um, yes, but I'm being told it is time for us to wrap it up. But just because there's questions we didn't get to, it doesn't mean those questions can't be answered. Um, I'm going to kick it back over to Kelly now, and she's going to wrap things up for us and with some technical things about the webinar. Marie, thanks again. Another stellar webinar, very educational. You made math palatable, so thank you for that. And I'm <laughs> kicking it back over to Kelly. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And thanks, Marie. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. If you would like to download today's slides, click the green folder icon on the far right of the dock at the bottom of your screen. And if you have any additional questions for Marie, her email address is on the screen now. Uh, an on-demand recording of today's webinar will be emailed to you tomorrow afternoon and will be available online for a full year at mypmp.net slash webinars. Thank you. <laughs>